Yeah, so as the title says, uh, I'm talking about computing with or despite the computer. And more specifically, uh, this is about uh, some work that I did recently together with uh, Alex Best and Ivana Coppola and uh, Sander Dame. And um, so in my PhD, I'm working on formalizing algebraic number theory. And very specifically, what I worked on recently is the part of algebraic number theory where we try to um, solve Diophantine equations. So we have some equations like... Um, let's say y cubed plus, uh, plus d equals uh, x squared. And we want to uh, find how many solutions there are. Maybe there's an infinite family of solutions. Maybe there are just finitely many. Okay. Okay, yeah. So as I was saying, we're uh, working on solving these Diophantine equations, specifically uh, model equations. And the very traditional way that uh, this has been done for over 100 years is that we uh, look at a ring of integers, we compute something called the class number, and then this will tell us something about the structure of solutions to this equation. And in our case, we prove that there are no solutions. And, uh, well, let me explain some of the words that I put on this, on this slide. So the class number is a finite number, and this is just the number of elements in uh, what's called the class group. And then the class group is the quotient of uh, a group of fractional ideals. Um, by the principal fractional ideals. And then, like, as we keep unfolding these definitions, then we'll have the fractional ideals of a ring R. Is uh, then uh, uh, It's like an ideal, but you also have some fractions. So instead of just having an R submodule of R itself, we take the field of fractions of R. So, uh, for example, instead of um, an ideal of the integers, we go to a submodule of the rational numbers but not just any submodule, but uh, specifically so that if we multiply everything of this submodule with some fixed number, then we go back into this ring itself. So you can imagine... Into the submodule itself, not into R. We go into R itself. Into R, into R itself. Yeah, yeah. so a submodule, you always go into R, into the submodule, but here specifically there is some number that if we multiply everything in the submodule, we go into R. So it's like an ideal divided by some element. Is and you allow zero, don't you? Uh, yes. Uh, you we, zero to be the yes, in this definition, we want uh, this multiple to be non-zero. But zero is a fractional uh, ideal. Yeah, so this is why I'm very careful to say invertible fractional ideals, right? Because in the ring of integers, we also have the zero ideal, and this is not invertible. And in other um, rings that are not dedicated domains, we might not even have that everything non-zero is also invertible. Apparently, this really helped um, some people recently because they wanted the class group for non-dedicated domains because they didn't really want to bother proving that things were dedicated domains. And so this is why I'm very careful to say invertible fractional ideals or instead of non-zero fractional ideals. And by principle, fractional ideals, I just mean uh, generated by one element. And in some way, the idea behind this class group is that it tells you how much, um, how far your uh, ring is from being a principal ideal domain. Because in a principal ideal domain, working with ideals is exactly the same as working with uh, just normal elements. But then if you have a more complicated class group, then this difference becomes a bit bigger. And uh, so you need to be a bit more careful with your computations. That's kind of the intuition behind this. Right. So the other word that I highlighted here is a ring of integers. And uh, I'm going to define a ring of integers of a number field is to say we take uh, the integral closure. So this would be all the elements of the number field that are roots of some integral polynomial. So polynomial with integer coefficients and the leading coefficient is one. And finally, a number field is a finite field extension of Q. So just um, some field which is bigger than Q and it's finite dimensional as a Q vector space. All right, so we see it's a relatively complicated definition to put it uh, to come from very simple terms into this uh, formulation. But on the other hand, it's not so complicated. Like this was all well known for over 100 years. So not very exciting for the, the modern uh, number theorist. Um, so why do we even want to bother with this class number? We've known this for hundreds of years, like it's a very common exercise and when you have a course in number theory, compute the class number, you give it to the students, uh, a few minutes, maybe one hour later they are done, and uh, like everyone always gets the same results. Sage can do it for us, so there's really no doubt that 
like we need lean to really be sure that the answer is correct. <laughs> right? So like for verification, this is completely uh, unusual because we are so certain that this is already correct. But um, OK, well, first of all, you might want to do something uh, with this class number, right? So our motivation is to solve these Diophantine equations, solve, uh, yeah, show that these model equations have no solutions. And um, well, this is uh, slightly more involved, so maybe you want to, to say, OK, well, can we really do this in Lean? And so it has some applications, at least. But really, what I think is uh, much more interesting about this application is that it's relatively evolved, right? So it's not just uh, working with random, uh, with very specific integers, not really working with just the reals, but we have some quite involved definition of uh, some layers stacked on top of each other. And then we want to see if this still fits in the theorem prover. And the output is a very concrete natural number. And so we, yeah. It's, it's very easy to test, like, did we get it right? And uh, finally, like, um, because it's uh, quite a boring calculation, like for mathematicians, it also means that this should be very much doable in a theorem prover. Like, if we cannot do this, then we should give up all hope of using Lean for anything, because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because this is just quite an easy thing for mathematicians to do. And if you fire up Sage, you ask it to compute a class number, and you let it print the result, quit Sage, then this is less than a second I, I timed it. So now I'm going to uh, disappoint you. We took um, many months to do this. Like, um, I would say about, um, on average, uh, two months of full-time working on this project to formalize the computation of the class number and use to prove that uh, certain equations have no solutions. Um, OK, so, well, this is many order of magnitude more than you would do by hand. So why did we even bother doing this? Um, well, one reason that is very important for me is because, well, Andre described this yesterday. Some things, when you say, I want to formalize this, you just get this feeling in the pit of your stomach that you know you're going to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so for you, it's in the then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You get this dread, <laughs> this dread that comes in. So, I, so we nobly sacrificed ourselves to be the one who did this and kind of um, make a report along the way of trying to figure out exactly what makes it so difficult. Like, why is this computation that is so easy for mathematicians so hard in need? And, uh, okay, well, I told a bit of a lie on the previous slide. I said we took months to do this calculation. In fact, we took um, maybe a day or two, really, to do this computation. So let's say a factor of 10 to 20 longer than uh, on paper. I mean, that's still quite a lot, but that's more in line with other formalizations. And in fact, most of the time we did uh, some, uh, yeah, some more uh, general stuff, like really setting up the definitions, we needed to fill in some missing parts of the theory that hadn't been landed in the, the Lean MATLAB. We wanted to figure out the right level of generality, so uh, we used some lemmas that, uh, first of all, we proved for like specific uh, square root of two, but then we later generalized it to square root of d, for example. And also trying to figure out, uh, like, what did we actually learn from this uh, process? And finally, uh, also trying to make this into a shape that we could also publish, like contribute to uh, the Lean Mathematical Library. OK, so I told a bit of a lie to start, but this is really uh, what you should take away is it still takes quite a bit more time than on paper, but it's not like you turn it into from uh, minutes into months, but more from minutes into hours to days. Yeah. So, um, I've been talking about uh, computing the class number, but that's kind of a vague definition, right? Like, what does it actually mean to do such a computation? And I think mathematicians and computer scientists are going to disagree very heavily on what, what it actually means to compute this, right? Because, um, well, when I write something on paper and I say CL of uh, Q squared five is equal to uh, one, I guess, yeah. <coughs> 
then um, what I do is um, I'm going to uh, look at these ideals. I'm going to check, like, uh, are they all principal? And then if I'm satisfied that they are all principal ideals, then the class number has to be one. So what I'm doing is kind of running through an argument in my head. I'm uh, not really doing anything inventive. I'm just going step by step through a process. And in Sage, you could say, OK, it works much the same way, right? Sage is, uh, if I ask Sage, what is the class number? Probably for this example, it will just look it up on a table. I'm not completely sure how it's implemented. Could very well be that um, like class numbers have been uh, documented well. There are big tables that you can just look up. Uh, I don't know, go on uh, OEIS and uh, see it. But um, there's also some very well-known algorithms to do this, uh, to do with um, quadratic forms. You kind of classify the quadratic forms in some way, and this then corresponds to the ideals. And this is already known by Gauss, for example. Um, and then doing this in lean is kind of this weird intermediate form where, on the one hand, we kind of want this argument to happen, right? We want to do some uh, proofs, but on the other hand, we also need to do some computations. We actually need to show that things are equal to other things. So that's why I kind of say, okay, I'm going to try to disentangle this notion of computation for what would happen like purely in mathematics is uh, if, we, if I say this holds by computation, then what I mean is we have some equality and we can prove it and we don't need to really think about it. We don't need to be creative to solve this. We just need to follow steps that are well known. Maybe we can try a few alternatives, but not really have any creative insight. Mm -hmm. And in, if I'm a, going to be a computer scientist, like I'm going to jump between these points of view. In a computer science, then um, you really have a fixed process, an algorithm. You feed it some input, it gives you some output, and it's done. So there's no real meaning behind this output other than it was just whatever the process returns. And then if we kind of try to synthesize this into what we're doing uh, when formalizing, then we need this kind of, uh, this notion of a process, like this fixed process, this algorithm. But also we need to say that it has to be the correct answer, like we need some sort of reasoning behind it as well. So in that way, what we're doing in Lean is quite different from what we're doing in mathematics uh, on paper compared to what we're doing on computer science. And all these different notions in computations are reflected in many different ways uh, whenever you're using a theorem prover. So I thought I'd give you a bit of a flavor of what you would actually encounter when you're working with a theorem prover, what we actually saw, what we actually need to go through to do these computations and uh, yeah, kind of describe how all these views of computation kind of come together. Yeah, right, so, and I think it really makes sense to say these are all computations because, well, if I just have a, a simple equality like this, 37 plus five equals six times seven, then in your head you're going to say, oh yeah, both sides are 42. And, well, there is an algorithm for evaluating plus, there's an algorithm for evaluating times, and we can just check that the output, which is just a natural number, we can check that natural numbers are equal to each other. So whether you do this in your head, whether you do this on pen and paper, on the blackboard, like, or on the computer, we can really just go through this process and we have our answer. So that's why I think it really makes sense to talk of, of these things as computations, because they all resemble this kind of prototypical example. Um, but something that is uh, much harder to make into a CS kind of computation is, for example, diagram chasing. So, like this is the category, kind of, yeah, you're given uh, some uh, diagram in category theory and you know all kinds of facts about some of the arrows and then you kind of glue together all of the arrows and at each step of, the, of this process you have like a few arrows that you can choose that uh, you can learn new things about. You just continue, yeah, figuring out new things to learn until somehow you're satisfied, you have proven what you want to prove. Yeah. And um, perhaps one important difference uh, why I wouldn't say this is really computation in the sense of computer science is that we're working with properties instead of data. And this is something that uh, I've kind of learned to distinguish as I'm working with Lean. So in Lean we have this notion of propositions versus data where in data it really, um, you can distinguish two different pieces of data, whereas with uh, propositions, 
whatever your proof is, it doesn't matter. They are all equal anyway. And I think when I want to talk about uh, computer science, I want to say we're working with data instead of propositions. Okay. But we can still formalize this in, um, in a very nice way. So um, you saw this morning, uh, there was, I think, was Wojte who um, made this? Okay, no, sorry. Then uh, I must have misremembered. But uh, like um, we have this, um, we have some uh, tools for Lean that can do diagram chasing. Uh, there was one written in Python, which then uh, supposed to generate Lean code. I don't think that's completely finished yet, but uh, yeah, this program in Python, it just tries to um, generate the proof that would convince Lean that this uh, diagram chase is successful. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so this is the work of Yanis Mumbrou, you're talking mm -hmm. about here. So indeed, it's, it's yeah. outputting a, uh, a proof, but in informal language. It's not okay. yet producing a Lean proof. Okay, I see. Thank you. But it's very nice anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, I saw it recently, and I thought this is exactly what I want to talk about. So. <laughs> And still, um, and another way we can uh, see it is then, um, yeah, we, we can also capture it in data, namely a Boolean, yes or no, plus a proof that this answer is indeed correct. So in some way, like, again, there's not really a big difference between uh, computer science and mathematics computations, but I think it does make sense to distinguish this in some way. And also another tool that uh, we really use for this kind of uh, computations uh, is the simplifier in Lean. So how that works is um, in uh, the Lean Mathematical Library, we have a huge mass of uh, lemmas that we all tag with uh, this simp annotation. And then whenever you don't want to prove some equality, you ask the simplifier to do it. And then the simplifier is just going to take every equality that it knows about, going to rewrite one by one until it, it either loops forever or it gives up because it cannot rewrite anymore, or it proves what you want. So this kind of um, relatively easy uh, ideas where you just try everything that you know until you are done, that's, um, that's formalizable quite well. Yeah. Uh, another interesting way to do computations is, uh, for example, this is an, uh, something that we needed in our proof uh, of the class number, is um, we are going to look mod 4, what are the squares? So, um, yeah, what are the numbers modulo 4 such that they, are the, that they have a square root so of the form x squared? Turns out just, um, there's uh, some nice theory behind it, but we just wanted to know it's 0 or 1. So 2 is, doesn't have a square root modulo 4. Yeah. And uh, there's a very, very easy way to, to uh, do this computation. We just go through all the examples. There are just four cases. We can easily compare uh, numbers modulo 4 for equality, so that's all very nice. And this also maps very easily to Lean. So um, this is basically how you would prove this in Lean. So we say, okay, let D be uh, an element of set modulo 4. Then this, uh, yeah, this has a square root, if and only if it's an element of the set 0, 1. Okay, I lied a bit, so you actually have to tell that this is a set, not a fin set, because Lean is particular about these things, but we'll just assume that that doesn't matter. And you can see that the proof is just a one-liner, and it's called deck trivial. And deck trivial is a very fancy tactic, so it's a, it's a procedure for yeah, providing uh, proofs. And um, how it works is actually behind the scenes. It, um, it's just a program that runs through the computation in a very computer science-y way. Mm -hmm. Right. And the trick behind it is this notion called definitional equality, which uh, I have a kind of a love-hate relationship with. <laughs> 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 and um, I would like to explain a bit about uh, this definitional equality um, because it's a very central concept to Lean. And it's also something that I'm very unsatisfied with, and I see a lot of opportunities for improvement uh, in computer science. Like, get the logicians, computer scientists to really improve this. Right. So the, the reason behind it is um, that Lean is a dependent type theory. So uh, we saw a bit of uh, the type theory before. We had this uh, Martin Luff type theory, which we can upgrade to get homotopy type theory. But um, in our case, we're going to upgrade it with this axiom K to get Lean's type theory, specifically calculus of constructions, but I'm just going to ignore all this, uh, 
all these details. Yeah. And um, this is very relevant for what I'm talking about because the whole point of Martin Love type theory is to kind of bridge the gap between these notions of uh, computation, so computer programming, and um, mathematical proofs. So, so mathematical objects, mathematical computations, computer computations, uh, logical proofs, they're all considered the same thing in Martin Love type theory. Yeah. So in the great tradition of all these intuitionists and computer scientists, we're going to um, try to do um, mathematics in a very computational way by giving uh, each object that we work about that we work with including our proofs this computational interpretation um, and this will look something like this uh, I, I picked a few examples so if we have this conjunction p and q then uh, in order to prove it well there is one way to prove a conjunction which is conjunction introduction you need to give a proof of p or a proof of q yeah if you're an intuitionist, there is one way. Huh? Oh, sorry, it's a P and Q, indeed. Yeah. yeah, indeed. So if you're an intuitionist, you believe this is the only way. If you're a classical mathematician, then you believe it's also by, um, uh, yeah, by a principle of contradiction. But, uh, well, Brouwer and Heiting are, and Komogorov are intuitionists. I'm also a bit of an intuitionist, so this is for all fine. I can interpose. This yeah. is not the only way because you could always go through a lemma. It's the normal form that is always going to be this. Every proof yes. can be transformed to this form. Indeed. Yeah. That's the point. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this is is perhaps a bit too uh, too strict of an equation. Not understand it correctly. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So perhaps we can say uh, always looks like or indeed. And uh, similarly, we're going to do uh, um, yeah, implications. So whenever P implies Q, we can show this by turning a proof of P into a proof of Q. And well, how are we going to do this? With um, I'm going to say a procedure, and this is going to be a primitive notion. We're not really going to uh, define what it means to be a procedure, but the way you should think about it is very much a computation or a computer program. So. This is the idea behind this computational interpretation that we're going to have proofs that we're going to compute with, that we're going to write programs about. Yeah. And then, um, very concretely, if we want to prove that P and Q implies P, then we want to write a procedure that takes this pair of proofs, P, Q, and turns it into a proof of P, which is just the first element of this pair. And in Martin Love type theory, this is just a primitive operation. In the calculus of constructions, you derive it from the structure of uh, your inductive type. But basically, um, we just define by virtue of the, of the axioms that we have this operation that destructs a pair into its components. You have a question? Is there some law of the intuitionist way to say that not P or not Q is, implies P and Q? Uh, so then, uh, let me parse that correctly. Not. Is, is there a way in intuitionist logic to say yeah. that not P or not Q implies P and Q? You are missing one not. Yes. Uh, and then it's going to go the other direction from what yeah. you asked. So oh. it's not not P or not Q. Is implied in, by P yeah. and Q. P and Q. Implied yeah. by the other way. Yeah, exactly. That's valid. Yeah, the this other is way. valid. Uh, both directions should be valid, right? Or uh, no, indeed. Yeah, yeah. So only in one direction. Yes. The, the rule of thumb is you can always go from beautiful to ugly. Yeah, exactly. But <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> as a working mathematician, yes. can I in lean? Just type in not P or not Q and it'll say, okay, P and Q, you're good to go. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So this is all very foundational. In Lean, uh, what we do is we actually add, um, well, P or, P or not P as an axiom. We, we do it in a more complicated way. But you can just use classical reasoning and that's no problem at all. And in fact, in the Lean Mathematical Library, we love classical axioms. We use them all the time. Um, 
but I think to understand the mot some of the motivation behind the design of dependent type theory, it makes sense to start out with this intuitionist uh, point of view. Yeah, and just on a completely personal note, not at all connected with, like not at all supported by the Lean community, I think that intuitionism is actually more interesting than classical yes. logic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I make very clear that this is not at all, uh, like, you don't have to be an intuitionist to like dependent type theory. You don't have to be an intuitionist at all to, to use Lean or to use Cork or Agda. You can always add classical reasoning as an action later. Yeah. Yes. And now, um, so first of all, I said, okay, we're going to give this uh, computational interpretation of our proofs. And now the second trick that we're going to use is actually we're going to uh, identify what it is to be a proposition with just what it is to have proofs. So the, the content of a proposition is just the set of proofs of this proposition. So I said uh, a proof of P and Q will look like a pair consisting of a proof of P together with a proof of Q. So this is just the Cartesian product of P and Q. And similarly, uh, a proof of P implies Q takes a proof of P, returns a proof of Q. So the proofs of, so the, the, the type P implies Q is just the type of all functions from P to Q. So in this way, we kind of capture all these primitive notions of, um, of having a proposition, of having a function, having procedures, having calculations. We can also capture them in just one thing, which is types. And this is very elegant, I would say, like just on its own. It's also nice because we still keep this uh, computational interpretation, and with these computations we can do nice things. Um, the reason that I'm specifying dependent type theory is until now I've just talked about uh, propositions, so just true or false things, if, we're, if we believe in classical logic. And now I'm going to talk also about um, more complicated um, so predicates, and then, for example, if we want to talk about uh, yeah, proofs like exist an, exist an X such that P of X is true, then what this P of X is going to be is going to be something, some type, that depends on X. So that's where we get the notion of dependent type. Yeah. And, um, well, if you're intuitionist, you want your your proofs to be very constructive, so you're not going to be satisfied unless a proof of existence gives you this x together with a proof that x satisfies this property. So we say proofs of existence really have to consist, have to look like, maybe not precisely equal, um, if we are going to be very precise, a witness together with a proof that it holds for this witness. Yeah. So in other words, um, according to Martin Love type theory, there is really no difference between the yeah, the logical statement, there exists an x such that p of x, and the disjoint sum of all proofs given by x of p of x. Yeah. Now, uh, we're getting pretty close to expressing all kinds of logic, but one thing that we really need is equality. And in Martin Love type theory, we have a very nice trick. We're going to say, okay, it's easy. Equality is given by reflexivity, and that's it. <laughs> so we can prove we can prove two things are equal if they're actually the same thing. And um, more specifically, we're going to say that if we have this identity type, A equals B, um, then in some very, very formal way, we're actually going to say whenever we have something of type A equals B, then it's actually going to equal the reflexivity axiom that shows that A is equal to A. Okay, if you like homotopy type theory, then you might be somewhat surprised because doesn't homotopy type theory say that we have tons of uh, equalities that are different? And yes, indeed they do. Although, um, yeah, I claim that what I said here isn't precisely false, it's just very, very summarized. Um, so if you want to actually make this precise, then you have to talk about recursors, and I'm not particularly interested in that. Uh, okay, so we have one way to prove that two things are equal, which is just to say, well, they are only, they, we can only prove things are equal when they are actually the same thing. Yeah. Okay, so until now I've been very, very vague about what I, um, 
what things we're actually working with. Like when I say A equals B, what are A and B actually, what do they actually mean? So they're not just strings of symbols. Like if A is a string one plus one and B is a string two, then we definitely want that A equals B, right? We want to say that one plus one equals two. But um, if we just look at them as strings of symbols, then they're obviously not the same string. One has a very different length than the other. So we need to give them some more interpretation in order to do this. And this is exactly where this computation comes in. So the fact that um, they are not just strings of symbols, but actual programs in a computer or actual expressions in mathematics that we can uh, compute with. So we can say one plus one equals two precisely because the program that adds one to one returns two. So, okay, this I think is a naive question, but would you yeah. not say two equals one plus one? I'm trying to understand yeah. the nature of this. I, indeed, yeah. So, um, yeah, in, in fact, we're going to say, okay, one plus one equals two because the program that evaluates one plus one returns two and the program that evaluates two also returns two. Yeah. Your one and your two are natural numbers or some Type, right? Yeah, in this case, yes. Yeah. Because but, uh, one and plus are just like <coughs> abstract symbols. Yeah, so in this case, they are still a bit of abstract symbols, and I would like to clarify in the next slides what they, okay. where they actually come from. But yeah, so in practice, we're going to define it as some uh, abstract, uh, some inductive type. Equal yeah. sign is not a symmetric thing; it means more like returns. That's no, what you're no, saying. Both sides yeah. evaluate to the same. Bo thing. Both sides evaluate to the same thing. Oh. So, oh. Yeah. So perhaps this, um, yeah, yeah, so this, um, this um, 35 plus 7 equals, um, what was it, 6 times 7, right? So both sides evaluate to 42, and that's why they're equal. Yeah. Because the program that evaluates 1 plus 1 returns the same as the program that evaluates 2. Precisely. Okay, good. Precisely, yeah. So in fact, um, independent type theory, we need a second equality relation to do this. And this is going to be the definitional equality relation, or I'm just going to say DEFIC because um, I talk about this a lot and I won't like to abbreviate it. Um, yes, so in this uh, definitional equality, that's exactly going to say when things compute to be other things. Yeah, and uh, we're going to say A is going to be definitionally equal to B, Whenever we have a computation, uh, yeah, whenever A is a computation that somehow uh, evaluates to the same result, can, can be normalized in the same way uh, as to have the same result as B. So again, this is going to be a, a symmetric relation, is the idea. Yeah. Now, um, I'm going to be a bit vague about what it means to have a result because this is kind of a subtle notion if, you, for example, you have variables, if you have, a, like if you have the, some proof context, you have um, i plus one minus one equals i, then because i is just a free variable, you, it doesn't have any meaning yet, so you cannot quite evaluate it at that point. But still we can uh, find a normal form, at least uh, in, if you have a nice type theory, and if you're a bit un uncareful with this, like lean, you can uh, get it more expressive, but then you sometimes lose this ability to normalize. I see. Yeah, I would just like to make a comment. You don't need normal forms for your type theory to be well behaved. You yes. just need this to be an equivalence relation which is compatible with the notion of calculations you mentioned. Yes. And indeed. the fact that lean, for some subtle reasons, yeah. doesn't have the normal forms does not affect. Here. Yeah, so although lean also doesn't have transitivity. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but it just needs to be an equivalence relation. Yeah, so. exactly. It needs to be like, uh, indeed, yeah. But I think um, for the purposes of my talk, uh, I think it's good to introduce normal forms at this point. To, then you don't to, have them. <laughs> yeah, it, okay, in lean we don't have them, but I'm talking about Martin Luff type theory and then uh, we're all fine. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so are you so are you introducing this as uh, like a like a meta language relation, like a mathematical relation, or like so equality is a type, right? Like yes, or indeed. We're so we're going here. Yeah. Is it a, a, a? It's a second kind of thing, indeed. So it's yeah. uh, it's not a type. It's a it's a judgment, just like um, uh, so, just like term has type t. You also have like term one equals term two, and both are going to be judgments that are like. And neither is going to be part of the other. They are going to be independent kind of judgments. Uh, 
so, so is definitional inequality the same thing as judgmental equality? Yes, okay. I should have said that in the previous slide. So, um, yeah, in Lean we talk about definitional equality. I think if you're going to be a bit more extensional type theory, then I think judgmental equality is a more popular name. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the crucial um, uh, property of this uh, definitional, this judgmental equality, is that whenever we can prove that two things are definitional equal, then we can substitute one for the other. And um, we can substitute it in the proof that some term has some type. So in the proof that... Um, hmm. So yeah, let me just uh, go to this example. Suppose that we have this uh, proof, REFL2, that 2 equals 2, right? Then uh, we can, uh, if we assume that we have this definitional equality, that 1 plus 1 evaluates to the same thing as 2, then whenever, because we can prove this, then we can substitute 1 plus 1 equals 2, and then we get the proof that gets that reflexivity in 2 shows that 1 plus 1 equals 2. So this is kind of surprising that uh, even though here I say we're going to use reflexivity on 2, it's not really reflexive syntactically, but this is because we have this computation on both sides going on. And... Um, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, is the substitution isn't it rather in the types than in the proofs? It's, uh, if um, A is yeah. convertible to B, then yeah. you can substitute A for B in capital T, right? Uh, yes. So, so it's rather right, in yeah, the I should, than in the proof. Yeah, exactly. yeah, I should be um, perhaps a bit more careful saying that this proof is really the... Uh, in our uh, judgments, yes. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing is in theorem proofers, all of this happens behind the scenes. So we don't just... Um, we're not going to write out the whole typing derivation. We're not going to write out a whole derivation of uh, definitional equality and then tell the, the theorem prover to substitute one for the other. Uh, Lean can just decide, or Koch can just decide, whenever two things are equal, then whenever you write one thing, it says, oh, but this is also equal to what I was expecting, so it's fine. Can you give an example of, of two terms that are, are, de are not definitely, definitely equal, but are, are equal in this little conventional yes. Yes, I'm going to comment that. Uh, so uh, one example is, I believe, in Lean, if uh, n is a natural number, then the following I don't think is... So you can prove this just by induction on n. Yeah, it might have... Zero, it might have what about zero plus n is n? Zero plus n is n, yeah. So I believe addition is defined by recursion on n, so... Commutativity certainly doesn't work. Commutativity certainly, yeah. So it must be the case that such uh, that there will be some variables. If there are no variables, there is a yeah. theorem that without variables it will always compute. And yeah. So you have to look for examples where there are variables. Yeah. Is it like the difference between a tautology and a true statement? Kind of, yeah. Yes. That's, yeah. that's right. Yeah. The, the what? A tautology and a true statement. Yeah. Uh, um, no, it's even more superficial than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Using induction and axiom, but actually added to the system. So kind of through, it's through by just unfolding definitions <coughs> and yeah. doing the obvious thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to do a case method. Yeah. A plus B is really defined. It's like, yeah. If B is zero, it's A. If B is the successor, it's this. But if B is just B, then. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. What uh, Jeremy Avogad said is exactly right, that it has to be uh, equal because you can just unfold the definitions and see that they are the same. So that's why it's called definitional equality. Yeah, um, yeah so what we do in uh, type theory is uh, in order to kind of get started with these equalities, then we need some uh, basic computation rules. We need uh, symmetry and transitivity. And also, for example, if we take the first element of a pair, then this is just exactly the same thing as this. First, uh, yeah. And then uh, whenever you make a new definition, whenever you define an operation like, for example, addition of natural numbers, uh, I'm going to assume that the natural numbers are already defined as some inductive type with uh, a zero and a successor. Then uh, we're going to introduce, uh, in order to introduce this new operation on natural numbers, we need to give it type and we need to give it equalities. 
So we're going to say a plus b, yeah, if, uh, yeah, plus is an operation that takes two natural numbers, returns a natural number. And in the case that on the left we have zero, and we add b, then we get b. And in the, on the left we have the successor, then we get the successor of the result. Yeah. And now if we have very, uh, whenever a and b are actual concrete numbers, like they're actual successor of successor of successor of zero, then we can uh, immediately compute that, that they are in whatever is equal. So one plus one really is two, because one and two are defined as like successor of zero and successor of successor of zero. Yes, I see a question. I also have another question about this. So if I'm like trying to verify large computations, like a million is equal to 10 times 100,000, yes. will that mean I get a stack overflow error because like I just it's taking suck, 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 like a yeah. Indeed, so maybe not in this case because Lean has some optimizations in the kernel, but uh, certainly in Lean 3 you would get a stack overflow or some... If you try to prove it with REFL. If you try to prove it with REFL, but we don't have to do that, indeed. Right. Yeah, so if we want to do this by definitional equality, we're going to have a problem. And I'll come back to that later, so that's a very good question, yes. Yeah, right. And so I'm... I just need to point out that uh, we have this uh, difference between the, the judgmental, the definitional equality, and this propositional equality, this equality type. And crucially, because we don't have that, um, this definitional equality is, uh, we're not going to view it as a type. It's not going to be able to be, yeah, to be introduced as a hypothesis. We're not going to be able to say one plus one is definition, definitionally equal to two and um, from Maslow's last theorem, for example. <laughs> yeah. um, they, are, they really live in separate worlds, so we're going to have two notions of equality. And this is not just a notational issue, it's not just because the inventors of dependent type theory uh, couldn't figure out how to get this uh, to work together. There really is some, uh, some fundamental way that you want to separate the two, because um, in the theorem prover, definitional equality checks are just done automatically. You don't have to think about it. Lean will just say these are definitionally equal or I cannot prove that they are equal. And this is possible only because we introduce equalities in very limited cases, namely only when we, in, when we give a new definition or in the primitive operations, so when we define an inductive type. Um, but if we are given an arbitrary set of equations, then um, we cannot just automatically uh, determine whether any two things are equal. So this is called uh, the word problem. And you can prove that if you can solve this, then you can solve the halting problem. So this really is not possible to solve algorithmically. Um, now one option is to say, okay, that's fine. We're just going to do, uh, uh, we're going to allow you to introduce new definitional equalities. And then whenever, uh, our attempt to prove fails, then it's your problem and you're just, uh, you just have to give more hints to the system. Then you get into something what's called extensional type theory. So for example, New Pearl has uh, some, um, some features along these lines. Um, but I think this is not quite the way we want to go. But I do think that it is um, a good idea to see if we cannot augment our type theory with uh, some more definitional equalities in a safe way that we don't run into the full, uh, the issues with just uh, allowing everything, that we don't get into the full word problem. But I think um, that Lean is still not smart enough to make everything definitional that we would like. Um, and let me see, yeah. Um, let me just skip this one. Yes, so this was a question that, uh, that you had indeed. That was a very good question. So in our definition of uh, addition, I used recursion on the left. So I said I had two cases, which is zero plus n and a case of successor plus n. So crucially, whenever we want to show that zero plus n is equal to n, then it's very easy. It's just definitional equal. It's just the first case of our definition. But when we want to show that n plus zero is equal to n, then we actually need to do something. We need to say, well, whenever we go through this computation for any value of n, we return the same as just n. So that's where we need to do induction. And then when we do induction, the first case is zero, and then we get this definitional equality, and the second case is successor, when, and we can use the induction hypothesis to complete this. So 
so you see that there's this very, very uh, deep reliance on the definition in order to check for definitional equality, right? Because if we, if we made a completely arbitrary choice to do, uh, do this recursion on the left, we might as well have defined it recursively on the right. In fact, uh, at some point, Lean switched the definition of multiplication, I believe, to be on the left instead of on the right. And they screwed up tons of proofs and it was really <laughs> annoying. And I think this will send any uh, software engineer, make it completely horrified because, yeah, any change to your definition is now a breaking change. And so this is part of my hate relationship with definitional equality. Okay, go ahead. So if you add the univalent axiom, does that make it better? Like, can you transport the proof of the left version to the right version? Yeah. Now that's a good question, but unfortunately, no. So um, both with and without univalence, uh, I think definitional equality doesn't change with univalence. We only get new propositional equalities. So we get more equals, more of these equal signs, but not more of these equal signs. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I understand that. Yeah. Uh, mm. Lee has k, so univalence is false. Yeah. So you don't really <laughs> want to add it. Yeah, but even in just a generic uh, dependent type theory, you're, yeah. So, and this is um, actually a reason that I'm not completely convinced that uh, hot is the way to go, because what I would really like is more definitional equalities and not more propositional equalities. And that's the thing that univalence adds. I mean, they're working on that too. There's sure. higher observational type theory. True, yeah. So. Yeah. But just hot itself is not quite. It's hot. The, the acronym is hot. So that's oh, okay, right. That's uh, so. confusing indeed. <laughs> that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so this is not just uh, some theoretical uh, inconvenience that, okay, we can prove this by reflexivity, but here we need some induction. But this actually really comes up when, for example, you want to define um, like a, uh, an exact sequence. So we are going to have like uh, a group of a uh, family of groups, each are indexed by an integer. Um, and then we're going to get uh, some homomorphisms which uh, go from I minus, yeah, the group at I minus one to the group at I. And then the mathematical definition of an exact sequence is then for every AI, the image of FI is the kernel of FI plus one. And if I type this into Lean, Lean will be, be very angry with me because we get uh, the following type error. The image of fi is a subgroup of ai, but the kernel of fi plus one is a subgroup of i plus one minus one. <laughs> and as I said, we de defined this uh, addition on the left instead of on the right, and now we have this addition. Yeah. Okay, so there are some tricks. We can just put the i on the left. The, the, um, we put the plus one on the left instead of on the right, and then <laughs> we can kind of cheat the system. <laughs> But really, if you told this to any mathematician, that you can uh, take the kernel of f of 1 plus i, but not of the kernel of f i plus 1, then they'd call you crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So whenever we're working in a MATLAB, then we really have to keep this notion of definitional equality in the back of our minds. Yeah. OK. Um, so can I ask a question? Is, yeah, sure. is it in fact, this is just a factual question about Lean. Is it built to prevent somebody like me from ever having to think about what you just said if I'm actually ah, okay. it, yeah. or do I have to think about it? Uh, so hopefully you don't have to think about it. So uh, I think we end up um, saying that we're actually going to introduce um, maps from any i to any j, which are zero er everywhere except when yeah i is j minus one. And then you're not going to run into definitional equality because you're just going to have to prove the propositional equality that Jordan, I'm oh, I don't have to think about it, by the way. I just don't yeah. want to think about it when I'm thinking about exact sequences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So you can definitely avoid uh, this problem in some ways, but still, it would be nice to not have to avoid it at all. Yeah. Can't we just add both axioms? 0 plus n is definitionally n, and n plus 0 is definitionally n. Exactly. So that would be something that um, we would like to add. Um, yeah, the thing is that you cannot just do this in unlimited amounts of ways, but um, I do think there is definitely a happy medium where we can still have this computable equality check, but also have some sort of uh, like extensible way of uh, definitional equality. Oh, isn't that a sec for having more definition? Um, so one drawback is that you have more ways that things can be equal, so checking becomes slower. Right. 
every time you want to, so the, def, the definitional equality is a part of an algorithm that works inside lean. So yep. if you're if you're adding new definitional equalities, that means you're changing the lean kernel. Mm -hmm. so it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, right. Oh, we're not supposed to change the kernel. No. So, <laughs> not a good thing. <laughs> Isn't this essentially what the simplifier is there for? Right, but then you get propositional equalities, right? So exactly. you have to say, okay, well, the image of fi is by simp a using cur of fi. Oh, I'm well aware that this is a huge issue. <laughs> yeah. So you get like, so the yeah, you can prove that they are equal, and then you can substitute along this equality, but you get this explicit substitution. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Is there like some implementation somewhere that is much better at? Avoiding this problem, like maybe not lean, but some other. Uh, yeah, I think Nuperl, but uh, there you really have to manually supply equality proofs. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, one remark: there used yeah. to be a project called Cog Modular Theory, which tried to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, Cog Modular Theory. Cog Modular Theory. Cog, okay. um, I don't think it's online. But it is. There have been attempts. <laughs> it is. You can try it. It's still, it's still available. Okay. Yeah, it's not maintained anymore, uh, so it's a few versions of, uh, behind. You can still play with it. And if we're talking <coughs> state of the art, there's also uh, some literature about adding more equations to the uh, mm -hmm. conversion to the yep. that theory of Cock or Lean. Um, mm -hmm. As you just, yeah. I mean, yeah. I really agree with all what you said, and it's yeah. very difficult. It's, you, you cannot add everything, but there are still classes of equations that you can add. Indeed. And yeah. this has been studied. And yeah. Or, sorry. Wouldn't an SMP solver attached to Lean just figure out like, it won't matter whether it's right or left? Well, but then the kernel would have to be able to trust the SMT solver when SMT solver says, oh, but this is the same group as this. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, it really is kind of a subtle problem because it's so deep in Lean's logic. Yeah. Right, I'm going to go quite quickly through uh, this slide. So, basically, this uh, notion of definitional equality is what we used in this proof that uh, modulo 4, all the squares are either 0 or 1. Because what we just did is we're going to um, write the program that checks this condition. We're going to evaluate this program using definitional equality. And if the result of this program is true, then we know that um, by virtue of the construction of the program, we can uh, tell that um, our condition is true. So we're going to run a computation in the kernel of Lean. And we're going to uh, use a proof that the result of this computation is correct. And then we are satisfied that, indeed, our proof is complete. Um, and this is indeed, um, yeah. yeah, this is called uh, proof by reflection. It's very popular in, uh, for example, uh, the Koch library um, uh, mathematical components. And this idea that we can just let the kernel do some computations to let it, yeah, let it convince itself that uh, some properties are true. But unfortunately, uh, despite some heroic effort by the Lean uh, implementation team, uh, Lean's kernel is not so fast. So what we actually end up doing in practice is, um, yeah, is something else, which is that we're going to um, let the, the execution environment come up with a proof that convinces the kernel uh, that it's true. So we're going to run the computation through the execution environment. And this has access to actual like hardware integers, like actual registers on the, on the CPU. And then it's going to produce some output, some certificates that convinces the kernel of the correctness of this computation. Yeah. So I'm going to compare this to uh, the famous Dutch tradition of the Elfstedentocht. So every uh, winter where it freezes in the where, where the temperature is cold enough and all the rivers are frozen. Then there's this skating competition between the 11 big cities of Frisia. And the contestants have to go for uh, more than 200 kilometers through freezing conditions. And the judges don't want to do this, right? <laughs> <laughs> the judges are happily staying in the, in the capital city in Leeuwarden. And uh, so what they set up is in every city there will be a, a post and um, you can hand in your, uh, your uh, participation certificate and they will put a stamp on, on this certificate. And then by the time that you come back, you will have the, the 11 stamps that you need and that will prove that you completed this tour. So in this analogy, the judge is going to be the kernel, 
who doesn't want to bother doing all this ice skating, and then <laughs> <laughs> and the evaluator is the evaluator is very fast and can skate to all these cities and get this stamp. So that's kind of the the idea behind this. And this is how we deal, for example, with these very big number uh, computations. So here's my example that 37 divides uh, 1 million minus 1. Um, and if we try to, def um, try to use kernel computation in Lean, then we just get a timeout error. It says, um, yeah, it, uh, it uses too much memory and it gets killed. And um, we instead use a tactic called normNum. And normNum can use actual like binary numbers instead of this piano definition. And then you get a much more efficient computation. And then as it goes through this computation, it leaves enough hints for the kernel to kind of reconstruct to know that uh, what normNum is doing is correct. So uh, in, in fact, um, what I did in uh, part of this um, formalization process for the, the class number is made an extension for norm num to deal with um, these uh, rings of integers. So we have um, z square root of minus 5. And then I taught norm num how to deal with this square root. So this is a very extensible architecture. And that makes it quite easy to do these uh, simple calculations in Lean. And then, um, but why don't we uh, extend this idea? And instead of using the evaluation in Lean, we use the evaluation in Sage. So we let Sage do all the hard computations. We don't even have to re-implement it in Lean. We just let the Sage developers uh, worry about that. And they are very good at making fast computations. And then Sage will return some hints as to the proof that you would follow in Lean. We use the elaborator, so the, the evaluator in Lean, to efficiently construct a proof for the kernel of Lean. And then the kernel can check this very nice pre-processed proof that can run through very efficiently. So we get a, kind of a, a layer cake of um, implementations that we have the Lean kernel verifying the tactic in Lean, which calls Sage. And Sage is actually using some implementation in Paris. So we have this layer cake. But the nice thing about the, the, the prover architecture is we only need the kernel to be correct. And the kernel, um, right? So we need to trust the kernel. But whatever we feed into the kernel, as long as it's happy that this is the correct proof, then we can be confident that the proof is still correct. Um, yeah, so, so you teach Sage how to return a uh, proof term. Indeed, yeah. So one way, uh, so one of my colleagues, uh, Alain, uh, actually wrote a, a Python program or a Sage program that will actually like just return lean code based on the Sage output. Uh, another way that you can do it is to use uh, proof certificates. So this is going to be some number, some polynomial, some matrix that kind of captures the essential like creative insights that you need for your proof. Uh, very much like the SMT solver certificates that we talked about, that uh, the, the previous uh, presentation talked about. So some way that we have this external program going through the, the proof in some way, doing some computation, and then giving enough hints for Lean to understand what happens. Yeah. And a very concrete example is uh, we did, um, so we did actually uh, work on this a bit, especially uh, Alex, uh, my uh, co-author worked on um, integrating Lean and Sage in this way. Uh, also, um, uh, yeah, like this happened simultaneously with another project uh, by a student of uh, Rob Lewis, and uh, not Heather Macbeth, I should uh, be very clear to say, right? And um, yeah, so what we both did is kind of uh, ask Sage to do the heavy computation and then somehow reconstruct this proof in Lean. And um, so in the context of number theory, one uh, thing we could do is if we have this Diophantan equation, we have, I don't know, x cubed plus uh, y squared plus uh, z, uh, z to the fifth is uh, 3. And then we say, oh, but this doesn't have any solutions because we can just uh, check modulo 4 and there are no solutions. And so Sage could go through all these um, all these uh, moduli and check whether there are solutions. And then as soon as it uh, detects that there are no solutions for some n, then Sage can return this n. And then we are in business because it's very easy to just verify for a concrete n. Right. Yeah. And then um, we also thought about some certificates that we could be used for uh, the class number. And then most of these were just we typed something into Sage. 
uh, we looked at the output and then we typed something into Lean. But this could all be automated that you could just call a Lean tactic, which starts Sage and computes what we need to know. Um, and yeah, coming up with proof certificates, I think, is a very interesting activity also for mathematicians. How to, um, yeah, how to simplify a proof to just saying, here is a very concrete object, and you need to check that this object works. Now, uh, I'm not going to talk about any of this, so yeah, let me um, go to the conclusion. So I had this, um, this uh, point at the start that, uh, well, we want to formalize some computation on the computer. And um, we said we took months for this. Well, OK, it was really a couple of days. But still, it's much harder than on paper. And this is because um, some things that are mathematically completely trivial to compute, so n plus 0, we can compute in a mathematical sense that is equal to n. But Lean doesn't agree that this has to be done. And then when you're working with the simplifier, you often have to give hints to it, which rewrite rules to use, and so on. But uh, still, behind the scenes, actually, Lean is doing a lot of computations for us, um, either on purpose or, um, so this is a slide that I skipped, but uh, with the simplifier, you can also get Lean to really do computations in the sense of the mathematical computations, or with the type class system as well. Yeah. And I think what we really should um, what you really should realize from this talk um, that I'm hoping to convey is that there is not just one way to compute. There's computation behind many, many different things in your theorem prover. And I think if you understand when to switch from one notion to the other, then your life will be much, much nicer. Okay. <laughs>